Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Colony Drop, a Gundam podcast. My name is Brian. And my name is Isaac. This is your favorite Gundam podcast where we talk about anything and everything from the Gundam anime series to movies, manga series, Gunpla, and even the lore and ideas related to Gundam. Brian, what are we going to talk about today on this episode? We have a very special episode today. We are concluding our review of the original Mobile Suit Gundam series. We watched the whole original series, and it's been a while for us both, I think. Right, Brian? I haven't seen it. Oh, it's been years. <laughs> Maybe a decade. <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen it front to back like that in a, since I originally watched it, probably. I'm, I'm sure I've watched bits and pieces of it here and there, but never from start to finish again. How did you feel going into like this last half of the first original series? Uh, I felt pretty good. I was pretty excited to finish the back half because I had forgotten, actually, how much happened in the back half. We got to the first half, and we hadn't even gotten to Odessa yet. And so in my mind, when when we stopped and did the first review, I was like, oh, wow, that means we still got Odessa, Jaburo, Solomon, Abawaku. That's a lot for, for the back half. It feels like nothing happened in the first half. Yeah, pretty much. That's a great way of putting it. I was watching the series. Well, first I went into it thinking... This is a lot to cram into like 22 episodes because, you know, they have to fight like a half a dozen mobile armors <laughs> and they have to like have, you know, the, the drama episodes where nothing really happens and <laughs> on top of the actual battles, like you said. So I was like, man, if if I could like redo this series, if I had creative control, if Sunset was in charge, <laughs> I would say do 50 episodes and, and really allow us to dive more into like, you know, different things happening behind the scenes or, or what, what have you, or do like two 50 episode series. So like a hundred episodes total, like season one earth and then season two space, <laughs> you know? So something like that, but man, it moves at a really quick speed. Some of the time and other times it feels like an episode took forever. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you are aware that it got canceled right halfway through. I am now. Yeah, so that's that's why it's not 50. They had to wrap it up at, at whatever it was, 42 or 43 episodes. 43, I guess, if you count wow. Dawn's Island. I think without that cancellation, they probably would have gone out through the 50 or the 52. And I, several people on Twitter, I guess uh, Mark Simmons and uh, Zionic, they've been putting out uh, a lot of good stuff that details like what would have happened and like the original ideas and stuff. So I would encourage everyone to go look them up on Twitter and look through the historical record and see what what may have been had the cancellation not come through. I've not actually gone through it and read it, but now that we've finished the series, I'll I'll probably go through and check that stuff out. Yeah, I'd I'd love to check it out, especially since like the way the series ends with the narration closing out. It just kind of ends. Yeah, I think they're (laughs) out of time, man. It it ends. (laughs) And the narrator's like, oh, there's peace for, for now. now. <laughs> like, well, you're clearly kind of implying that there's going to be problems. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so <laughs> Tomino or whoever managed to sneak that in, they they wisely foresaw that this might actually be successful and the series might continue. Probably the wisest decision, I think, Isaac, is that they did not show the death of Shar Aznable. Yeah, it was left pretty ambiguous. Then again, you know, kind of anime rules and tropes and all that. But if you didn't see a body, they're still out there. <laughs> right, but I'm just right. saying with it, with the context of the cancellation, they could have just been like, well, we're never going to make another one. We're canceled. Let's just show them die. But they didn't. Yeah. And look, that really paid off. Nope. So Yeah. <laughs> Unlike Kaecilia, who we are guaranteed <laughs> will not be returning in the next series. <laughs> Uh, all right, Isaac, so I'm, I'll give the overview of the second half here. You ready for this? Do it. Yeah, it's going to be a lot, listeners. Get ready. <laughs> That's right. I think the first one was like four or five bullet points. I got like 12 here. So we left off, Isaac. Episode 21, I believe, ended. The white base had just been shot down by Makuve. Episode 22, the white base is currently grounded right in the border there, Europe and Asia, right before the Battle of Odessa. They end up getting resupplied and patched up by Lieutenant Matilda. However, it costs her her life but it does allow them to participate in the Battle of Odessa to defeat, but not kill, Makuve. They then head to Northern Ireland, which I believe it's Belfast, to get fully repaired. But Shar returns, this time underwater, with the Mad Angler sub or squadron, whatever you want to call them, which, by the way, may be the best name for a squad in the show. (laughs) I mean, they really missed the opportunity for, like, an angler-looking mobile armor, right? (laughs) Oh, like, yeah, like a a lanternfish type thing? (laughs) 
Yeah, yeah. And like the yeah. big jaw, there's like a laser in there or something and the teeth <laughs> missiles. I don't know. <laughs> if you were around in 1979, Isaac, they would have used that idea. <laughs> Oh, I would have pumped out mobile armor concepts left and right. <laughs> I'd be team mobile armor. <laughs> we were in the snow. Well, we got to fight like a Yeti mobile armor. <laughs> we're in the desert. We got to fight a scorpion mobile armor. <laughs> After leaving Belfast, General Revel sends them to Jaburo, which is the Federation headquarters on Earth. Sharp then pursues them across the Atlantic underwater. Shar ends up finding the entrance to Jaburo, and we have the Battle of Jaburo, but Zeon is rebuffed. Our our heroes in the white base then return to space to attack the space fortress known as Solomon, which is led by Dozel Zabi, one of the Zabi sons. But before that, they stop at Side 6, which is a neutral colony, or a neutral colony cluster, I should say. But unfortunately, Isaac, they leave Side 6 without repairs to join the Tianan fleet for their Solomon attack. We then have the Battle of Solomon, which is one of the largest battles in the original series, where Amuro fights Dozel Zabi in the Big Zom. Definitely one of the most memorable fights. Then, after the Battle of Solomon, we have a pit stop, Isaac, where Amuro duels Makuve in the Texas colony in his Gan. We're going to talk about how you should pronounce Gan today, Isaac. <laughs> <laughs> after dealing with Makuve, the white base and our heroes return to Solomon, which is now being used as a base by the Earth Federation, and we encounter the new type, Shalia Bull, also known as the Man from Jupiter. After dealing with Shalia, who is a quite an intriguing character, Isaac, even if he was brief, Operation Star One commences, where the Federation at- uh, attacks the second space fortress, a Bawaku. So we have the Battle of Bawaku, and the Zeon de facto leader, Giran Zabi, unleashes the solar ray system, Isaac. One of your favorite moments in the Mobile Suit Gun franchise. Uh, <laughs> it's bittersweet, I'll say that. Right. <laughs> As a consequence of the solar ray system, Degwin Zabi, the Principality of Zeon's Patriarch, and General Revel, de facto leader of the Earth Federation, are incinerated. Also at this battle, Amuro in- accidentally kills Shar's love interest and sort of Amuro's love interest as well, Lala Soon. Cassilia Zabi then kills Giran Zabi. Amuro and Shar duel it out in a Bawa coup. The Gundam and the Ziyong fall. Shar kills Cassilia. White Base falls, and Amuro leads the White Base crew to safety. And we end with an armistice and basically the promise that peace exists for now, Isaac. Yes, and Zeon is gone, replaced by the Republic of Zeon. And uh, Federation wins. For now. Yeah, for now. <laughs> and everybody lived, which was great. Well, we lost a few people <laughs> along the way. Eh, well, uh, all right, you got me there, but you know. <laughs> the real core crew Yeah, lived. that's true, that's true. So, Isaac, I have a list of things. It was very hard to organize them in any logical fashion, so I'm just going to pick them one at a time, and maybe we'll just trade off with things we noticed. How about that? That sounds pretty great. And listeners... Just because of the way conversation goes, you know, podcast and all that, we might jump around throughout the course of like the last half of the series. We, we won't necessarily go in chronological order. So bear with us. Hopefully you've seen the series or at least rewatched it or at least have a general idea of what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll try to go in chronological as possible, but some of this stuff is just easier to organize based on character sometimes. So <laughs> we may jump ahead a bit, but. And first on Brian's list is pronunciation. <laughs> Well, the Gan is later, but we'll get there. There's two pronunciations today, Isaac. There's Gan and, and Jaburo or Jabrow or Jabro, whatever you want to say. Not, not to backtrack, but even in season one, I think it was pronounced by Ramba as goof. Mm. But I think Bright Loa later called it the guff. Maybe they played with it a few times. I, I think guff gets yeah most of it. But yeah, maybe there was one or two episodes where they, they started out with something else. So that wouldn't surprise me at all. First on my list, Isaac, is something near and dear to your heart. We saw the debut of a mobile suit this back half, which I actually forgot how prominent it was in the show from here on out. It was more common than the Zaku in the back half, and that is the Dom. Yeah, I forgot how much, especially when they get into space, the Dom really replaced the Zaku. You only see the Zaku in two battles, really. You only see it at Solomon and a Baku, mm-hmm. which is clearly when things were bad for Zeon. Right, right. So uh, other than that, the Dom just takes complete center stage. Were you empowered by that? Were you energized by all the Doms in, this, in the back half here? <laughs> On the one hand, yes, <laughs> because I was like, okay, this is great. I got to see Doms. And, you know, I forgot. Like, I was like, oh, yeah, the Federation. I forgot to call them skirts, you know, <laughs> yep, yep. As, as being very dismissive. <laughs> but, like, as the battles continued repeatedly, I was like, you know, I don't think they're performing better than the Zaku. <laughs> Because they're getting smacked, you know, left and right. 
<laughs> they did get smacked around. That goes even for um, Zeon's fleet. I was trying to lose count of the number of fleet battles that the, the white base gets in alone yes. and still defeats a larger fleet. <laughs> <laughs> We first meet the Doms when we meet the Black Tri-Stars, Isaac. Gaia, Ortega, and Mash, and for listeners, I'm sure you know, those are the uh, the three Dom pilots that uh, end up killing Lieutenant Matilda, and uh, they then incur Amaro's wrath, and they all end up dying, but what did you think of the Tri-Stars, and can you explain the jet stream attack to our listeners? Well, first let me say that although I am a big Dom fan, I never found the Tri-Stars to be that impressive in the original series mm. now hear me out in origin they're amazing because <laughs> they like oh my god they might have been responsible for the majority of xeon's victories in the beginning yeah right yeah, i fair. mean on luna at loam they were vital yeah they, they mopped the floor with like you know dozens if not hundreds of kills so that said back to the original series we just saw man they were they were such a nuisance like they they didn't do a whole lot i mean they're kind of infamous for like killing matilda but she was unarmed you know she was in a transport yeah (laughs) transport plane yeah that was an ill-fated intervention by her i i don't think anything good was going to come out of that right so in summary i think the tri-stars are very much a case of um their reputation was really what preceded them and that was really all that was the threat otherwise they they weren't too much of a danger and the jet stream attack seems to pretty much be they line up, head towards you, and attack you consecutively. Maybe one moves in one direction, one moves in the other, and then one would jump. So you're being attacked from different angles, even though you thought you're going to only have to face like one after the other. The Tristar has really struck me as some ace pilots who had never really been challenged. Yeah, and I feel like this is something that kind of repeats. You yes. know, we, we hear about all these aces and these great pilots and, you know, how powerful this mobile armor is. They've only been fighting Type 63 tanks. Maybe they went up against a big tray at some point. Yeah. Federation naval units and Federation aircraft. That's it. That's all they've been fighting. So, of course, they've been winning. And then they fight the Gundam, the gun tank, the gun cannon, and white base, which is covered in tons of powerful weapons. And the inevitable happens where they're out of their element, they're outclassed, and they get defeated. How bad luck is that when your first mobile suit you go up against is the Gundam piloted by Amuro Ray? In a lot of the cases, they kind of ask for it too, right? Because they keep kind of repeating this whole desire to hunt down the white base, yeah. right? It's, oh, it's a two-rank promotion, automatic two-rank promotion. I'm surprised they never had like one scene, maybe they'll put in the remake, where an officer was like, you know what? Somebody else can get it. <laughs> <laughs> because clearly the all the data reports <laughs> and the analysis says that this thing has been through multiple battles. <laughs> it's killed multiple, you know, multiple of our units and regiments and is keeping on trucking i do not want to fight this thing send me to fight like you know the -the run-of-the-mill type 63 (laughs) okay let's move to general revel for a second here isaac uh poor guy (laughs) speaking of matilda he showed no real remorse when she died did you notice that or at least we don't see it yeah but in his defense he's been pretty high ranked in the military if not more or less a supreme commander. It's 0079, Brian. So, <laughs> what is it? September 0079? Something like yeah, that. Yeah, around then, yeah. He's seen half the Earth's population get destroyed by the colony drops F- effects. Yeah. He's seen who knows how many people die during the one-week war, um, not to mention all the other destruction and uh, battles that have happened at different sides. So, losing another officer, even a rare female one like Matilda while tragic. I'm sure he's, it's just another Tuesday for him. (laughs) Matilda Monday. As cold and callous as that sounds. Yeah. I mean, this is, you know, humanity's worst war. So unfortunately he might've not so much forgot about it by the next week, but you know, she was just a statistic the next month. That's fair. What about though, instead of sending supplies to the white base, shouldn't rebel have sent them some like real pilots? Or does that go against their data Um, gathering scheme? I was about to say, I think that goes against their data gathering scheme. And at the same time, technically, Omro's, at every point after the first episode, Omro is the most experienced mobile suit pilot in the Federation. Oh, that's true. That's a good point. Yeah. Every minute 
after the moment he gets in that cockpit, he's by default the most experienced pilot in the Federation Army, Armed Forces. So there isn't technically anyone better to put in. That's a good point. I've never thought about it that way. Yeah, and by that logic, that's kind of a slippery slope of, well, why is a 19-year-old the captain? Okay, let's swap out the captain. Well, what kind of crew does the captain need to support him? Well, okay, we'll, we'll swap out, you know, the, the bridge crew. It's like, well, shouldn't we get better engineers and, you know, actual staff? Well, okay, we'll, we'll swap them out for someone from the Tiananmen fleet, you know, crew from the Tiananmen fleet. So it, it could have very much have been a case of um, we'd see our whole cast replaced if that did play out. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's fair. I mean, I guess that, that sort of aligns with, there was that one line, I don't remember if General Revel was there, when they're at Jaburo, the higher ups are not pleased that the white base was followed there. And there's a comment where some, one of them says, they will always be a problem. What do you think about that take? Is that true? I think that might have been more, well, half true in the sense that, well, they're civilians, so they're not really going to do things the way we normally would or we'd like. But I think that was more just a reference of, well, since almost none of them are actual military, things are going to be happening kind of chaotically outside the norm, outside military standards. I think that's what he was referring to. Mm. I took it as they were upset that the white base, because they have the Gundam, they're always going to have a target on their back. So by, by harboring the white base in Jaburo, they, they drew Zeon there naturally. But yeah, I could see that as well. Uh, I think that's a bit of a stretch, right? Because Operation British was designed to attack Jaburo. Yeah, they've always wanted in, right? Yeah, I mean, I guess this was a case that, well, you might have a point. He might have so much been saying, um, you clearly gave Zeon a way to kill two birds with one stone. Yeah. So thanks a lot, <laughs> you know, but at the same time, well, this is kind of the top base on Earth and for the Federation. So it's it really is a fortress. I, I don't think we have a lot to worry about now that one more ship is here. Yeah. OK. And they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Because <laughs> they survived. <laughs> yeah. Zeon kind of got spanked. And then a little later on, there's this sentiment that the Federation thinks if they defeat Solomon, if they break Solomon, that Zeon will surrender. Do you think that's true? I don't think that's true based on the way Giran's thinking. I think it was true. So after Solomon falls, guess what Dagwin does? He decides to lift his heft out of that chair (laughs) and whatever back channels he still has to the Federation, they, they were meeting for peace. You know, yeah. you saw the writing on the wall. Look, look, they can take Solomon. Sure, Tianem died, but they were able to deploy a, a solar system, cook uh, Solomon. Yeah. Even though it was destroyed by the big Zom, they can just build another one. <laughs> it's the Federation, you know? Yeah. They can clearly wait out Zeon. So let's make peace. Who knows how many generations, or maybe Dagon would have to die, literally, if they did make peace. Ooh, that's a good alternate history kind of uh, timeline to explore. What if they made peace? Mm, someone would have to kill Garen a lot quicker. Yeah. Day, well, Dagon, assuming Dagon dies of old age, I assume Garen would have the war ready to go after that again. Yeah, exactly. But anyway, I digress. So yes, Solomon being knocked out did push Dagwin to the peace uh, negotiation table. However, <laughs> nobody assumed that Garen would kill Dagwin <laughs> and then continue the war. <laughs> so it's a, it's a failure of Federation intelligence then to properly assess Garen's how far he's willing to go. Worse than that, I think Federation intel failed in detecting a solar ray or... Yeah, that's fair. If they did at- detect it, assuming it wouldn't be constructed in time, assuming Xeon didn't have the resources, or assuming it wasn't a weapon capable of destroying fleets from so far away. So, yeah, that kind of dropped the ball there, whoever's in charge of Fetty Intelligence. But yeah, yeah, they were right. Solomon being gone would, would clearly push the moderate faction in Xeon that was actually technically in control of the government to negotiate, but hardliners like Giran. And uh, I assume Delaz were like, oh, yeah, definitely kill them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's tackle the pronunciation of Jaburo. So in this series, the dub pronounces it Jaburo. In, I think, 8th MS team and potentially 0083, they say Jabrow, uh, which right. sounds a little cooler. And then I was having, like, mental difficulty with this because there was that PlayStation game, right, Journey to Jaburo or Journey to Jabrow, whatever you want to say. Back when that came out, I swear there was either uh-huh. a commercial or somehow I got it in my head, it was pronounced Jabiro. So I got three different pronunciations of this damn headquarters floating around in my head every time I talk about it. So I bet if you go through the, all of our episodes, I'm sure I say it different every three episodes. And you know what? That's okay. Which pronunciation do you prefer, Isaac? 
I started with 0083, so I like Jabra. Mm. But phonetically, I can understand why people look at it and say Jaburo. Yeah. <laughs> and then I'm sure they're like, well, it's in South America. Of course, it's probably pronounced something like Jaburo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? But I like Jabra. Yeah. Okay. I don't think it's a real place. I think it might, some people think it's no. based on this <laughs> place in South America called like Jabiru or something like that. I don't know how to pronounce it, but so maybe it's a little bit up in the air. But listeners, I'd, I'd be curious, which pronunciation do you prefer? And is it the one that you started Ooh. with? Yeah. My, my head canon is kind of similar to Gundam Seed. If you haven't seen Junk Gundam Seed, listeners, there's a military base used by the Earth Alliance, which is pretty much their Jabra, except it's called Josh A or Josh Wa. Yes. And, well, my own made up acronym for it. Well, Josh A, that clearly must mean Joint Operations Strategic Headquarters, Alaska. Mm. So I took a similar approach, and I assume Jabra is like Joint Allied uh, Base of Operations. I don't know. Who knows? Or regional unity. I don't know. Wow. I love that. I want, I want the acronym for that now. <laughs> yeah. Well, when we have our episode of Gundam Jeopardy, we'll have people trying to guess what <laughs> Jabril stands for. <laughs> Isaac, there was a few more slaps in the second half. Yeah. There wasn't as many as there was in the first half, but there were some good ones. Right. There was when, uh, when everyone was getting promoted, the Federation officer mm-hmm. tried to slap Amro and he dodged it. And, but then the guy like yeah. slapped him again. So he did, he did catch the second one on the face. You think Amro would have learned <laughs> that like, if an officer's trying to slap you and he doesn't connect the first time, you have to get out of slap range because <laughs> there might be another one coming. He needs to bob and weave, you know? Yeah, just don't stand there. <laughs> uh, there was also when they were in, I guess when they were in Jaburo or Jabral, there was this other set of kids, the other orphans, and they were making Kika cry. So our other two kids, Let's and Cats, I think I think Let's though was the one that smacks the other kid that was making Kika cry. And I was like, look, even the kids are taking on this aggressive behavior by what they're seeing from the adults in in, in this world. That's very sad. I do vaguely remember the slap. <laughs> <laughs> was that when they were with the robot nanny? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think so. That amazing robot that can serve you like snacks and juice. Yeah, I think it was like ice cream maybe in there. But r- perhaps, Isaac, the best slap in the back half of the show was the Slager slap. Can you explain the Slager slap to us? <laughs> the Slager slap really came out of nowhere, I have to say, because Slager hadn't been with the crew that long. And really, I didn't think anyone would slap, not to sound sexist, a woman. <laughs> right yeah then again this was animated at a different time so maybe that was more common but man he like went right up to mirai and gave it to her because she was what was she doing she was arguing with cameron her fiance yeah cameron bloom her somewhat desperate (laughs) desperately in love with her fiance yes who was very interested in helping them any way he could and she was really turning him down I can't believe Bright didn't cut in and say, could you guys talk about this not on the bridge? Um, (laughs) Just so they would go somewhere else and talk it out. But Mariah was kind of getting rude. I mean, she was getting rude. But Slager apparently thinks uh, if if we're being offered help, we got to take it. So he went across the bridge and he gave her a backhand, not even a slap, a backhand. (laughs) Man. And it it shut her down. Goodness. He moved real quick. If you go watch the, the gif of this... Man, he that dude moves faster than we've seen him move the whole show. He, he moves faster than a dom speeding into battle. <laughs> and what's what's kind of insane is, did everybody on the bridge agree that she deserved it? Because nobody said anything. No, no. Like one, yeah. the other women didn't say anything. Mm-mm. Bright didn't say anything. They just let the slap happen. <laughs> I don't know. What do you think of Slager, Isaac? He, his image or, or whatever was supposed to be based on uh, Sylvester Stallone. But uh, right from the beginning, you know, he <laughs> the first time you see him, he immediately hits on Mirai. He calls Amuro his little buddy, which made me crack up. As soon as he returns from that first battle, he straight up asks Mirai in front of everybody if she would like to shower with him. So, like, this guy is like, he wouldn't make it in today's Me Too world for sure. Uh, in that scene where he, it might be the same time that he slaps Mirai, he also flicks Cameron away and steals his glasses. Yeah, right, because he thought, yeah, he thought Cameron was harassing him. Yeah, like, but like, where does this dude get off in like meddling in their business, I guess? Because he's kind of like giving it to both of them, right? Like, isn't that strange? 
Yeah, I mean, first he sounded like he was like, "Oh, I have to protect Mirai from this guy that's clearly, you know, he doesn't know how to how to take a no. Right. He's gonna rough him up and you know knock off his glasses. He called him pencil neck, I think. <laughs> and then hours later on the bridge, he backhand Mirai for <laughs> how dare she on behalf of the ship refuse so much assistance when they're in dire straits. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, I was Team Slager up until then. At that point, I was like, all right, buddy, this is this is kind of toxic. I know you're Mr. Hotshot fighter pilot, but, man, th- did you have to do that? <laughs> <laughs> what a terrible thing. That was when he got canceled right there. You know it's bad when Admiral Isaac cancels you and he's in Xeon. <laughs> Say what you will about Xeon, but we don't slap women or even men for that matter. <laughs> <laughs> I challenge you to think of one slap that happened in Xeon. There hasn't been one. <laughs> That's true. I, I don't think yeah. any of the slaps we saw were Xeon slaps. Oh, you might be onto something there. We respect each other. <laughs> <laughs> just not humanity in the basic yeah, sense. Just, I mean, we'll, yeah, we'll use weapons of mass destruction, but you won't be slapped. <laughs> <laughs> Staying on Slager for the moment. At the end, though, you know, when he leaves to fight the Big Zom, which I guess is really what cancels him, is the Big Zom. Mirai kind of reveals that she does kind of like him, and they, they share a little moment before he leaves, and he gives her his grandma's ring. What's your headcanon on why she likes this guy? Because, like, Mirai's pretty reserved. I feel like she likes people that are respectful. This guy yeah, is not that. Like bright? Yeah, like bright. <laughs> and so, in my mind, the, the only way this makes sense is she's sick of people liking her because she's from the Yashima family. And Slager knows nothing about that, and he hit on her right away. So maybe she was like, oh, well, this guy, maybe he doesn't care about my, my lineage, and, and he likes me for me. Uh, how did, does this make sense to you? How did you take this? It doesn't make sense unless you really like dive into your own mind to develop headcanon. So for me, I was, I was trying to piece it together. I was like, okay, we're in a war. Cameron Bloom's clearly going out of his way to to be kind of her yes man fiance she yeah. doesn't want that okay well what about bright she's got a good thing with bright you know they're kind of the the team mom and dad uh, apparently she she doesn't want that it's like okay uh slager uh, i i guess emotions are running high and guess who shows up it's the the alpha male the 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 cocky fighter pilot he says what he thinks and he lives with his emotions on his sleeve i guess that's what she wants and I was like, you know what? There must have been a shower <laughs> that we didn't see because otherwise it doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Maybe she, she gave in to temptation yeah. and then had a wild and crazy night with Mr. Rough and Tumble, Mr. Slager here. Yeah, there's a scene, I'm sure, where, I don't know, like Amaro's talking to Sela and then in the background you see like two people run out of the bathroom. <laughs> And one of them's blonde, one of them's brunette. You're like, uh, I wonder who that was. I don't think that was Kai. <laughs> Not many blondes on the ship, so. No. <laughs> that could only be one of two people and sailors on the bridge. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, I I assume it's a case of kind of being swept off your feet or, <laughs> yeah. in this case, backhanded off your feet. <laughs> This would never fly today. No, no, it's it's very bizarre. And I'm not the biggest sliced alone fan, but I would be surprised if there's any movie where he's that disrespectful to women. I mean, if you see the Rocky movies, he really he's devoted to his girlfriend, to his wife, Adrian. Yeah, so. <laughs> I don't know that it was based on his performance. I know it was supposed to be based on his image, I think. Yeah, okay. But how about Slager's blue uniform? Did you like his blue uniform? I thought it was pretty cool. But, hear me out, Brian, him wearing a flight suit at his death does not explain why he died, right? He gets, like, ejected from the cockpit in his flight suit. He should have been okay, I assumed, unless he was crushed and then ejected. Well, I think it depends on what kind of debris he hit when he left his cockpit. Okay, so he was, like, concussed inside. He was internally destroyed. Yeah, I I think if you go pick him up, I don't know that everything is intact in that flight suit. That's how I read it. Like, what's her name from Shard's Counterattack that got squeezed? Exactly. <laughs> Oof. <laughs> <laughs> and then Ostinaj had to go look at her, uh, her visor oh, filled with the jelly. That's terrible. Poor Ostinaj. Uh, that's if you can't even find the guy, <laughs> right? Is he just floating around yeah, out there? right. I mean, well, they didn't make much of an effort. Somebody found him. If, <laughs> yeah. well, the Federation took control of the island, of, of uh, Solomon, yeah. so somebody found him. Oh, boy. <laughs> So I guess if you didn't like Slugger, he really got it at the end. And sometimes when Bright and Mirai are in the throes of passion, <laughs> she'll ask him to backhand her. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> 
<laughs> uh, do not condone that comment, listeners. <laughs> Maybe we should edit that out. I'm leaving it in. <laughs> That activates like bright into like you know super mode, and then he he's he's allowed to go into the bright slap mode. <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> slapping such a part of if you join the federation, slapping such like a part of like your shared trump. That might be one of the classes <laughs> at the Basque Om school. But I don't think they slap. Well, they punch. <laughs> you know, they, well one of them slaps Camille. Oh, yeah, Isn't yeah. that that that's kind of how Xavier Gunham starts, right? It was a slap or was it actual punch? Uh, I don't remember. Hand on face <laughs> violence. Whether you go to the Bright Noah Academy or you go to the Bascom Academy, there's going to be physical abuse. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Come to Xeon. We don't do any of that. <laughs> <laughs> what are your thoughts on this whole Slager Mirai thing and how she, kind of with the flick of a switch, became madly in love? She was concussed into love. <laughs> I think it's because he didn't care about her Yashima family lineage. Because every time Mirai meets someone new, they say, oh... We're so sad that your dad died, and he was a great politician, and maybe if he had lived, the war might not have happened, and here, you know, dock here, and consider that payment for your dad's services, blah, blah, blah. The way it makes sense to me is her whole life was, hey, you're important because of your family name, but then, boom, here's this guy who, you know, like you said, says what he feels, no matter how bad it is, and he's like, hey, you're cute, I like you, come shower with me. Mm Mm-hmm. And she was like, wow, this dude doesn't know who I am at all. And he, you know, and he wants to be with me. Maybe in some weird way that flipped a switch for her. Not to say that it's good or, or it makes complete sense, but people do weird things. So that's how I made it made sense. But doesn't mean it was a good relationship. Not that it was even, I don't know if it even really qualifies as a relationship at this point. But anyway, that, that's my take. What did you think of Slager as like a character, oh, a, a temporary crew member? <laughs> um, I mean, I enjoyed him. I, you know, I laughed when all he, when he was doing all of his stuff because I was like, wow, this dude's ridiculous. But you know, at the end of the day, he had a good strategy and he made a, a good sacrifice. He stopped the big Zom, Isaac. The big Zom was blowing people down. Nothing was yeah. standing in the way of the big Zom. In like four seconds, it blew up like four Salamis. Yeah, and he did it non-verbally. Yeah. <laughs> he, he like did a hand signal to Amr, and I was like, all right. It was like a smile, and he was like, you know what? Th- this guy's had enough fun. Let's take this right. guy out. <laughs> and he did it. He got it done. So at yeah. the end of the day, he did sacrifice himself. So you, you got to be a little thankful for that, I guess, if you're a Federation person. So I don't know. I, I liked him. I think he served his purpose. You know, not every char- I'm one of those people that I don't need every character to be virtuous and uh, a likable person because that's just that doesn't match real life right characters are allowed to be told, frankly yeah and he fits the bill <laughs> absolutely <laughs> so originally when i watched this series i could not stand the kids mm. i thought they were just annoying i didn't know if this was some care bear attempt to like bring in younger viewers i was just wanting battle after battle but watching them again now, they kind of have like a, a charm to them, you know? It, it, they weren't as bad as I remembered. And I felt kind of bad for them that they were there the whole time. And uh, as we got to like a Bawaku and they were the, actually on the ship as, again in space, yeah. I was thinking to myself, wow, if this did happen, could you say, well, the ship was taking damage. Please stop shooting. We have kids aboard. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and depending on the Xeon officer you got, if they're anything like Ramba Rao's crew or the um, the Lagoon pilot, they'd probably stop fighting and say, okay, either surrender or get the kids off the right. ship. Flash them up on the screen, something like that. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe if you run to like Makuve or somebody else, they might say, this is clearly a Federation trick and then just blow <laughs> up the ship. <laughs> so... <laughs> I think the best moment they had was their hero moment when they saved the white base. They were able to detect all the bombs. Somehow they were able to drive a car. I I don't believe they would have reached the pedals. It kind of would have made more sense if they did (laughs) the usual comedy thing of kids where like one kid's actually down there with the pedals, right? Like using his hands and then the other one's like steering, right? That kind of would have made more sense. Yeah. But in any case, I thought that was a a good episode for them. And they kind of literally saved everybody's lives, if you think about it. Well, not everybody's lives, but who knows how bad that explosion could have been. Probably pretty bad, actually. So they definitely saved some people's lives from letting that gym factory go off. Yeah, that was the Gundam factory, right? So had that explosion gone off, I mean, the gym production line would have been halted or at least severely, you know, curtailed. So it was actually pretty yeah. important and pretty pathetic that the Federation yeah. had to have the kids save them. 
also like those were bad Zeons. Because if you remember, like they jump the the little Zeon ninjas, they jump out into of the dark, <laughs> you know, kind of surround the kids, tie them up, and left them with the bombs. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so I had a question about that. What was the point of tying them up sure. if they're just going to tie them up with the bombs? It doesn't mean they're not going to die. You left them with the bomb. Why not just kill them yeah. anyway if you're just going to let them explode? That doesn't make any sense. But I think the guy apologizing before he left was, he did. sorry, kids, you have to die. You know? <laughs> yeah. It wasn't, sorry, kids, we had to tie you up because they were going to die from the bombs. I, I think the, maybe in his mind, the only mercy was, well, the bombs are going to go off so pa- so fast, it's going to be painless. The kids mm. aren't going to know what's going on. Okay, and they're that they're that close, so they'll just be incinerated right away. Okay, how thoughtful of that Zeon soldier. Yeah, him and Makuve went to the same university, so, or him and, him and Sahalan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I liked the kids. You know, I, uh, I agree. That moment was good. And then I also liked the bit at the end. We're skipping all the way to the end, the very last episode. Oh, yeah. Not many people could really hear Amuro's voice that well, psychically, except Mirai, Sela, and then the kids, revealing that, obviously, the kids growing up in space, they were pretty far along on the new type scale. So, Brian, would you say that they're so young, their souls aren't held down by Earth's gravity? (laughs) Yeah, I would go so far to say their souls have never been weighed down by Earth's gravity. (laughs) Should we should we splice in Haman saying that's the stupidest thing I've ever <laughs> that's heard? That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> Another kind of interesting thing I noticed at the end was the kids are in normal suits, mm-hmm. right? When they're showing Amuro kind of thinking about the crew and picturing each one, seeing who's still alive, I guess, with his mind. They show a cut, I think, of Frau Bo talking to like the kids and the little girl's holding like the barrel of a rifle. Oh, really? <laughs> Do you think they were actually like manning some guns or did she just pick up a a live rifle or maybe bright wisely said look the kids are going to be causing problems if we tell them to like stand in an area holding empty weapons they'll stay (laughs) at least in one spot well i don't know i mean maybe they did pick them up and and do something with it hopefully they were at least aiming it in the right direction yeah it reminds me of the ending episode as well when the white base is down on a balaku and bright tells fraubo to get a sidearm and I'm like, look, pal, if that's where you're at, we're, we're, you're not you're not in good shape. <laughs> like, we... yeah, <laughs> the ghost of Rambo Rao was like the last time that woman, <laughs> that girl held a sidearm. I was able to slap it out of her hand. <laughs> that's how good she is. <laughs> yeah. So same thing with the kids. I mean, if you're relying on the kids, I'm sure they didn't tell them to pick up the rifle, but I'm sure they tried because they like to contribute. Right. And if that's what they see everyone doing, they're going to do it, too. Yeah, and they wisely seemed very sad and scared. So I assume they felt the ship crashing. <laughs> yeah, can't be a good feeling for sure. On the subject of kids, Isaac, there was another tragic set of kids in the show in the back half. And that was Miharu's siblings, her brother, little brother and sister. Miharu it was the girl that, in Ireland that Kai sort of had a crush on, but got tricked into giving her info. And she was a spy for Xeon. She was a great spy. She was a great spy <laughs> and really got screwed given that her, you know, handlers attacked the ship while she was still on it. That was kind of a jerk move. Awful death for her falling off the, was that a gun parry? Yeah. I I couldn't believe how brutal that death was. We didn't even see, technically see her death. We just knew it happened. Yeah. Very similar to Slager, right? She was just lost out of the craft. Yeah. Never to return. He was ejected into space and she just plummeted who knows how far into the water ice cold water as well it's cold up there so uh, anyway miharu had a heartbreaking story awful death uh and so i was wondering to myself isaac do do we know what happened to the kids because in my mind we needed an epilogue where kai went back and found them and like you know took care of them or something and of course they've been covered in some side story mangas so the little girl millie she works as a hacker for kai in the zeta gundam define manga which is like a retelling of zeta gundam wow with with some minor alterations my understanding is i've never read z Z gundam define but i'm sure those there are some out there who have so anyway she's there it looks like kai reconnected with her and and gave her a job or, or otherwise you know worked with her Jill, the boy, is a cyber new type test subject in Zeta Gundam 4 Story and to a Soldier, which is a novelization about how uh, 4 became a cyber new type at the new type uh, research institute um, from Zeta Gundam. So I feel like it turns out pretty well for Millie. I feel like it doesn't go so well for Jill in the future. I don't know. Like, actually, no, I think you're right because the lives of cyber new types can't be good, no, right? I no, mean, name one that's gone well. <sighs> None. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's unfortunate, but 
I don't know. Maybe his his future ended up okay somehow. No, I'm not sure. I spoilers. <laughs> I don't think he makes. It. <laughs> of course not. But I mean, good on Kai. That's the silver lining, right. right? That he went back, and the kids clearly knew him, and I, I imagine he looked after them as much as he could. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Man, how sad. God, she was such a good spy. She was like the perfect honeypot for Kai. Mm-hmm. She wouldn't have worked on like a sailor or a Mirai, right? No. But for Kai, she was at the perfect spot. Well, who knows? Mirai seems to just like a, <laughs> like random people hitting on her. So maybe if Miharu yeah. did it, maybe she, she would have gone for that too. <laughs> maybe if Miharu slapped her, <laughs> they would have fallen in love. <laughs> and it's like, ah, I love you now. <laughs> I mean, one of the Miharu episodes, or one of her handlers, Captain Boone, he lands on the white base in the guise of a fishing plane. And he tells his co-pilot or his, you know, co-conspirator to not talk because his Xeon accent is too strong and it'll give him away. Has that ever been brought back or was that a dropped kind of world building plot point? And was it supposed to be a German accent? Because the, the guy, they had him talk and like he had a really strange voice. That has never come back. So that raises the question like, is there a group of colonies where people talk different? Is everybody we're hearing from Xeon using like a Federation accent? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. What are the implications? You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I remember reading about this way back in the day, but I haven't, th- I hadn't thought about it again in probably 15 years. And then I saw it this episode, and I was like, oh wow, I, I don't remember what what the answer to that was. So, um, I mean, I guess I could look it up. But listeners, if you know if this is a drop plot point, I, I would uh, appreciate the refresher. So, and what would you imagine the accent to be like, Isaac? Because I, I don't feel like people in the Zeon colonies have lived there long enough to develop some new accent that is completely identifiable. No, and it doesn't work because all the Xeon leadership, they just speak with a normal accent. Like if they were speaking their true tone or accent, it would sound so different. Yeah, You're being a little too literal if, say, for example, the original plan was that we'd have Xeon with German accents or yeah. Italian accents or uh, or Japanese accents. At that point, it's like, okay, uh, come on. We already know they're the Axis. They're wearing Axis <laughs> uniforms. <laughs> so at that point, why, why not call him like Von Guerin or uh, <laughs> Kaisili off or something? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So th- that, that's excessive, and I'm glad they didn't do that. That throwaway line, though... Uh, I don't know. It, it it didn't really make sense at all in any way, really. I agree. Not needed. Glad they dropped it. So, Isaac, let's talk about two things that I did not like. Uh-oh. Wow. <laughs> Probably the biggest thing that I did not like about this show is the G-Fighter. I don't like the G-Fighter, Isaac. Yeah. I don't like how it looks. I don't like how it performs. It's got pointless transformations, some of which are very dumb-looking, like the one where the top half of the Gundam and the bottom half is a plane. They call it the Gundam Sky. And I can totally understand why Tomino replaced it in the films with the core booster. It felt too super robot to him. He tried to remove all the super robot elements as much as he could. And honestly, I feel like Sayla, I liked seeing Sayla do stuff, Isaac. But every time she was doing something, I was like, you know what? It would be way cooler if she had a Gundam instead. Yeah. At the same time, that would have kind of pulled away from Amuro since, you know, one Gundam, one show. Well, okay, it doesn't have to be a Gundam, but give her a gun cannon or, or a third gun tank, gun cannon, gun, whatever you want to call it. It doesn't have to be a Gundam. I just mean it didn't have to be the dorky G-Fighter is what I'm saying. Right. You know what she would have gotten? She would have gotten the pink hover tank Gundam. Oh. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> the pink hovercraft mobile suit, right? <laughs> something yeah. like that. And its chest has like a bow missile or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but there was a perfect opportunity, you know? They, they She could have picked up her pink gym at Jaburo when they were at the Gundam factory and they'd been like, oh, look, this one just rolled off the line. You want to take it? You want to keep it? So I don't know. I just don't like the G-Fighter, Isaac. I completely agree with you. It's a case of toy-driven animation. So we have to see the chest visible as it flies around, right, yes. in the armored mode. And and then it has to be able to configure and, oh, we need more armor. So dock only halfway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it was ultimately wacky, but maybe the, if you think about it to an extent, kind of like the first time for a long time we see a woman being that prominent in combat unfortunately yeah no she and she did a good job like over you know she didn't start out great yeah but by by the end she was knocking him down you know always competent yeah the other thing i didn't like isaac and this was also changed in the compilation films 
not, it wasn't so much that I didn't like it, but it was just too wacky, or it just looked really out of place. So the gun tank was fine on Earth. But then when they get to space and, like, Hayato starts going out in the gun tank, and the gun tank's just kind of floating out there with its, like, treads, it makes no sense yeah. in space, and it's, it looks pretty silly. And so it was very clear that it needed to be replaced, and that's why he gets a gun, t- uh, a gun cannon. Yeah, it was pretty terrible. But, I mean, <laughs> if you've already... <laughs> built the factory that's going to make the gun tank models you're trying to sell you're sending it into space (laughs) (laughs) the only time it makes sense is when it's kind of hopping around on on asteroids or on on a babaku and solomon and that's kind of like okay it can do these little short jumps and stuff like that but yeah i almost wish like they reconfigured it like they removed the treads and like swapped in like these two big cylinders as like booster rockets or something right yeah really anything to just not have it look like a tank floating in space because it was like oh don't worry hayato's coming to back you up in the gun tank and then like here he comes floating in the gun tank and i was like oh boy like (laughs) might as well just stay in the ship yeah the, the gun tank was maybe the weakest and most useless out of the three the gun cannon could be pretty competent. I especially liked it when Kai would like, he would get an enemy close and then just drop down those two guns or one of them and blow the enemy away. Yeah. <laughs> I was pretty sad when the gun cannon fell and a Baoku got its leg chopped off and that was pretty much the end. But yeah, it served well. I yeah. liked it. Something about taking out the legs. When you take out the leg, it really collapses. You know, that even happened at the Gundam when the Zeong hit it with that like perfect beam shot that took out almost its entire right side. Yeah, the mouth blast. Yeah, that thing was pretty intense. Yeah. Staying on Jabiro for a minute, we got to talk about all the amphibious mobile suits in this back half. Oh, man. Xeon, like, they put too much money into amphibious mobile suits. Like, instead of having two or three, they had, like, six. (laughs) (laughs) So let's see if I can get them all here. First, we saw the Gog. Then we saw the Zagok. Then we saw the Zok, I believe. And then we saw the Ak Guy and the Grabrow which was the mobile armor. So there was there was four suits and one mobile armor. So uh, we can all agree the Zagok is the, the clear winner, right? Yeah, it's definitely got the best design and look to it. It doesn't have the ridiculous proportioned head of the Ak guy. <laughs> it, it doesn't look like a little bridge troll like the Zok. What about the Gog? W- without the Gog, though, I feel like there's no Juagu. Or is the, is the Juagu more of an Ak guy? Maybe it's more of an act guy. I was going to say, the Juwagu is more of an act guy. Yeah, yeah, definitely the, well, the head. The head is way more act guy. I don't know. I feel like it's almost too divergent. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's some of the, Z- the Zagok in, in the Juwagu, right? Let's see. A little bit? You can see some of it? Oh, it says developed. The, well, the wiki, if you believe the wiki, the wiki says it was developed from the act guy. Okay. Okay, there you go. That That still doesn't make complete sense, just looking at the designs, but... Sure, they took the internals and kind of slimmed them down <laughs> to an extent. But I, I've never liked the Ak guy's bulbous head. The Gog it was always just, I don't know, clumsy? <laughs> it's a little thick. Yeah, it's a bit of a, a little bumbling mobile suit. <laughs> the Zagok, though, seems way more perfectly engineered. Like, that that's a killer. Right, you yeah. Know? Yeah, you're afraid when the Zagok comes by. But, like, when the Gog yeah. comes, you're like, I could probably outrun that. <laughs> And the Zok was just, that was a dead end because we never saw anything like that again. (laughs) It was just a poor design. It was way too bulky. It didn't look agile at all. I, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I'm glad we never see the Zok again. (laughs) The one we don't get in here, which I think they put in Gundam the Origin, the manga, but it was in 0080, which was the High Gog. That one's actually my favorite amphibious mobile suit. Yeah, like it, it's so sinister with its longer limbs, right? Yeah, if this was ever redone as the Origin style, I would look forward to seeing the High Gog more because that was pretty darn cool. I'd be very interested in everything being not redesigned, but given the, the facelift treatment that we see so much in modern Gundam anime where they, they took what was originally drawn and they really tech it up and detail it up to the point where we look at it and we're like, wow, I would want a model of that. Yeah, I agree. But let, let, <laughs> in closing for the amphibious mobile suits, or if I could just add, I almost wish they just sent in doms. <laughs> <laughs> at least they would have been able to hover and go fast, right? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> what was the point? The amphibious ones didn't perform that great anyways. Yeah, I don't know. I mean... <laughs> Were they looking for that entrance to Jaburo the whole time? Is that why they had so many? Or Actually, the best amphibious thing they had were 
I don't know if you remember this, but when the white bass was crossing the ocean, they were getting torn up on the bottom from those little sea to air missiles that had the funny little fins on it. Do you remember those? Those were hilarious, That's and they true. were just wrecking the white base. Those were way more effective than any of the amphibious mobile suits. Yeah, white base is designed for uh, re-entry into Earth and exit from Earth, space combat and flying in the air, but I don't think it was really oriented to preparing for an attack from the ocean. What about the Federation, though, Isaac? Did they ever have a significant amphibious mobile suit? I know there's the Aqua GM, but I don't think that really caught on, right? <laughs> They didn't need to because the Federation (laughs) at the start of the war had a massive Navy, a Navy of the world. (laughs) That was their Navy. So whenever they had to go up against Xeon, I imagine it was just a mix of their naval forces and their air forces. So it was sort of a non-issue. And really the, the need for mobile suits was on land against Xeon Zaku's. In space against the you know, space Zaku's and Doms and, and that type. I can't see a need or reason for the Federation to have aquatic mobile suits. And rightly so, <laughs> <laughs> because the amphibious mobile suits are n- next to useless. Any success that Zeon had at Jabral, and I'm talking about the ninja team, they did that on foot. <laughs> they could have almost just as easily just sent in some type of amphibious landing craft with their ninjas and gotten the same result. Yeah, but then they wouldn't have been able to run away in their at guys putting their claws into the ceiling and swinging like Spider-Man. It made no sense, but I loved it. Yeah, th- those at guys also got shot up a lot. I think not all of them made it back. No, I don't think any of them made it back. I'm pretty sure that whoever went with Shar anywhere as his wingman <laughs> With an amphibious mobile suit, they all died. I'm pretty sure Amro shot them all. You'd think Shar would be kind of half avoided by now, right? Because yeah. everybody's like, well, he was at this battle and he lost and everybody died. Well, <laughs> he was at that battle and he lost and everybody died. You know, like, I do not want to be on the same ship Shar is because we're going into combat and we're probably going to die. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Except him. I agree. And then not only should you be leaving Shar alone, but you should also be leaving the Gundam alone. Right. If you see the Gundam, wouldn't at this point, wouldn't yeah. you be like, ah, I'm going to run the other way. Like, that's cool. I'm going to go around the back. Yeah, like that side story, I think in Skull Heart, right, that we read about where oh, yeah. <laughs> they recounted the Battle of Solomon and how horrified like most troops were like to fight the white mobile suit. <laughs> and then they saw the disproportionate head and they assumed the Gundam had been destroyed, but that it was massive. <laughs> <laughs> In the era of uh, Monofsky particles, it's it's very hard to um, get a firm grasp on what's real and what's not. <laughs> yeah, totally. So Makuve, this back half, we got to see him threaten the use of a new Isaac, which is uh, obviously against the Antarctic Treaty. Right. Is that was that a good move or was that a catastrophic move potentially? That's a good question. It, so if the nuke was successful, you mean? Yeah. So he gets out and the nuke is successful, but then. He, Zeon all of a sudden has to deal with the fallout because they're going to be like, hey, your dude over here used a nuke. Guess what? All of our nukes are now coming to your colony. <laughs> I think Zeon would have been okay with it. And I think the Federation wouldn't have been able to deploy really nukes like that at the snap of their fingers. What we probably would have seen is maybe a, a scene with Kaecilia scolding him a bit, but at the same time kind of acknowledging, well, it's good that you defended Odessa. Yeah. But even if that did work, Zeon's still on borrowed time. The Federation will just put together another army and attack again. Maybe they'll use their own nukes. I don't know if they want to nuke Earth. What we could have seen, though, in space is maybe the Federation getting a bit more nuke happy, like in Char's counterattack, where mm. it's it's a, it's a little expected that you'll throw nukes at each other a little bit. Yeah, just to, <laughs> just to spice it up, nuke here and there. Yeah, just like, well, maybe we'll take out their whole fleet. Maybe they'll shoot down the nuke. We'll see. <laughs> you know, <laughs> We'll sneak, sneak one in. So it would have not really changed the outcome of the war, but it might have delayed it. I'll mm. put it that way. Okay. Uh, he made a really interesting comment when he escaped via the Zanzibar. He said Zeon can fight for 10 years with the minerals that he sent to Kaecilia. Was he yeah. overestimating himself, or is that true? Is that why Axis survived so long? Well, what did you think about that? That is exactly what I read. I read that Makuve's operations, or Zeon's operations in Earth in general, in the One Year War, moved so much mining material into outer space that even up through... I guess the sleeves crisis, the sleeves war, they were still using material that they'd obtained from Earth. Wow. Pretty much almost scot free to just keep building military units. That's a cool lore line. I like that. Yeah, it was right. He knew the numbers going into space and, 
Yeah, there's, there's no way we're going to use that stuff overnight. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think, though, that it was necessary for him to escape and then we see him later? Or could they have just dealt with him um, right there? Like, w- would the show have been that much different? No, no, especially since he wasn't so much of a threatening villain or even one that I imagine a lot of fans like. But it was a very Makuve move to kind of slither away and fight another day. Yeah. Well, what about the Gan or whatever, however you'd like to say it, when Amuro duels him in the Texas colony? I wrote down a list of like best cinematography shots in this um, back yeah. half. And I loved the shot of the Gundam entering the Texas colony, holding the wrecked shield. The Gundam is so small relative to the, the colony entrance. It was just really cool. One, how do you pronounce the Gan? I, I believe the dub actor in this series called it the Gan. Without remembering that, I've always called it the Gyan or the Gyan. How do you say it? And then you hate the Gan, <laughs> typically. Are you any more or less of a fan of it after this rewatch? The shield missiles, I thought, were cooler than I remember. They, it seemed pretty effective. Yeah, the shield missiles are cool until the shield gets destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> but I always found the mobile suit to be too prototypish. It really was almost just a vehicle for somebody to use a beam saber against the Gundam. Mm. That kind of seems like the whole purpose of that mobile suit. But I've never been a fan of it. I thought it looks too much like a knight. Makuve clearly had too much influence in his design. <laughs> <laughs> and I've always pronounced it the Gian. The Gian. Oh. Maybe the Gyan. Okay. Man, I didn't have Gian on my list. God, now that, that's four for that one. Listeners, what are other ways that you pronounce the Gan, the Gyan, the Gyan, the, the Gian? Throw them at me. I'd be curious. The, under your uh, Makuve design, did you notice he had a custom Ga- Gyan helmet? Gan helmet? Yeah, he got a little brown and yellow crested helmet, right? <laughs> he did, he did. All the good it did him, but but he did have a custom one. Yeah, and his final words, of course, were to make sure she got the vase. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the vase. I, did they ever go into like, detail? I don't remember specifically what what was so special about it. Was it from like France in like, the 17th century or like China from like the Ming Dynasty or something like that? I don't recall, but yeah, I, okay. I guess his priorities were skewed a bit. The bigger question is, did Kaecilia get the vase? Yeah. <laughs> well, she got something. It would have been nice if we like saw it on the bridge later like with her, right? <laughs> yeah, the, the, the rocket should have like first broke the vase and then her face. D- <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> that rhymed. That was That's great. That's terrible. <laughs> first, I, yeah, Char's poem. First I broke the vase and then I rocketed her face. <laughs> Was the relationship between Makuve and Kaecilia almost a one-way romance, or was there really no romance at all, and Makuve was just really deluded into thinking he was some kind of knight on a, on a mission for a lady in a war? You know, I've never approached it that way, but I, I've always wondered if Kaecilia had any romances, because I don't think we've been shown any. Is that correct? Unless you count Makuve. No, she was all business. Right. And I don't even know if I would count Makuve because with the times we see them talking alone, it's very superior and subordinate. <laughs> right. Yeah. She she doesn't strike me as the type who would go for someone like Makuve. No, no. She strikes me as someone who would go for someone like Slager, but she would be giving the orders. Yeah, actually. Oh, I don't even know if she'd go for Slager. You know? <laughs> yeah. I didn't catch much love between them. Maybe um, professional friendship. That might be the closest that I caught. Right. So Yeah. Shared goals, maybe, tell. or shared interests in the art world. I don't know. Yeah. But I, I don't remember her saying much about art at all. It might have all been from him. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. So before some of the more serious topics, Isaac, on this rewatch, something I noticed is that the gyms did not have a good showing at all. I don't recall really any moments when the gyms contributed anything meaningful to the battle. I think maybe we saw one or two destroy a Zaku or a Dom, but that's pretty much it. Yeah, it's it's much more implied that it's off screen or in the battle montages, it usually show like the gym or the ball get a shot and then get destroyed. Right. Yes. The Zaku and then like the Xeon Space Fighter shoot a missile and then get destroyed. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So we're at the meat grinder phase of the war. Yeah, so they were just more like fodder to push forward, I suppose, and with the the idea that one of them will do something if you send enough in. Yeah, and <laughs> it'd be cool to see a, a side story anime series of just the gyms, right? You know, yeah. throughout the war, and they hear kind of rumors about the white mobile suit, and that they're based on it. And they're like, "Well, I wish we had that survivability right. or stuff like that." <laughs> right? Or, you know, are they going to make more of those white bases? <laughs> 
<laughs> Why can't we get I'm one? I'm on my Solomon. <laughs> Yeah, and I don't mean that. I don't mean this con this comment in the context of like all gyms did poorly because obviously there's a ton of side stories where they do great things, but like within just this show, yeah. they really don't do much. It's just we know they're in the background, we know they're fighting, so clearly they're off in the distance somewhere, getting kills and being destroyed. Let's talk about one of the main victimizers of the gym, Isaac, and that was Dozel Zabi in the Big Zom. Maybe one of the coolest episodes right. in the show. The Big Zom's last stand. All the gym pilots called him the monster. Dolzel decides to lead the remaining mobile suits out of Solomon towards the main fleet. Uh, what a guy, right? That's the guy you want as your leader. And there's this scene where he emerges from like the halls of Solomon, and he melts all the gyms and the balls in his way. And it's just fantastic. And then he flies out in the Zom right into the Salamis fleet and destroys four Salamis all at once. Do we know how... I tried to look this up, but I didn't find it. Do we know how many he took out at Solomon? I mean, what were they going to do if the Gundam wasn't there? I mean, no, they couldn't put together the solar array in time. And I think he destroyed what's left of it, right? So they couldn't deploy it even at, like, a fraction of the strength. Well, they had already shot it twice, I think. Cause, and I think the yeah. second time was only at 60% chance of working. Because I... When they fired it the first time, it was interesting. They definitely showed a lot of the mirrors melting. So they can't keep firing that thing. <laughs> I'm about to say it, but this might be the situation where the Federation needs a nuke. Yeah, there, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> right? Other than that, you just have... Well, they can't even... You, okay, never mind. I'll take this back. It would have to be missile barrage, like Amaro pointed out. We can't really use our beam weapons. We'll have to rely on missiles. So it would take the Solomuses eventually deducing that. And then some... At, I assume General, uh, General Revel would say, look... This thing is clearly causing a lot of damage. Beam weapons don't seem to be working. Everybody fire your missiles in this zone. Yeah. And then that would have done it just through sheer numbers. Uh, would they have had the time to make that decision though? Because he was just, you know, blowing them up as he goes along. I don't know. But at some point they would use missiles, I suppose. But Yeah. With, with the number of ships and missiles going around, uh, it would have gotten hit sooner or later, so... I, I think it was it was a matter of when the Zom would go down, not if. But the amount of casualties that he would have inflicted. A lot. Had they mass produced the big Zom, that would have been pretty cool. Had he not been killed so early, I imagine Revel would have been much more eager to pick up the call when Degwin called. Mm, true. You've previously described the noise zeal as looking like the ideals of Zeon took shape. I kind of think that's true of the big Zom, at least the one year war version of Zeon, like the, the Zabi Zeon. It's not quite as elegant as the Noiseal, but it has that intimidating silhouette. Yeah. It's very other, right? It's it's opposite of the Gundam, which is humanoid. The big Zom has these huge legs, this weird torso, these horns. I don't know. I really like the big Zom. Big fan of the big Zom. Yeah, it's pretty great. And even compared to the other mobile armors it's in a league of its own not just because of size but design the other mobile armors if you looked at all their silhouettes you know like pokemon style like what <laughs> pokemon is it they they do kind of blend together right yeah. we got the slit mono eye in the middle that's always huge mm -hmm. they always kind of have a, a bulbous size to them uh, maybe a couple arms or pincers or something claws and that's it big engines in the back so a general kind of a frisbee approach to the design. <laughs> but the big Zom, it's like this kind of gourd, onion, onion <laughs> this trapezoidal <laughs> onion with massive claw legs that are almost never used to grab just for pure locomotion. And then it's got like multiple cannons on it and stuff like that. It's, it's pretty cool. And it takes a team of three. Most mobile armors we saw just need a single pilot which might explain why they don't live as long yeah but <laughs> that's fair whoever realized that okay bigger mobile armor more people they made the right decision <laughs> what about mirai's father should we have gotten more background about that or like were those few comments enough yeah i would have liked his appearance almost in the same way frau bo loses her mother and i think grandmother in episode mm -hmm. one 
it would have been nice to see a vague idea of what he does. Maybe we see a guy running around and clearly a, a high level officer's uniform and he gets killed or he's in like a, a suit leaving with um, some important delegation and their shuttle gets taken out. You know, j- just stuff, the clues we could have seen were, oh, wow, a big mover and shaker got taken out. And then later on, it's, oh, you were later Mirai. Okay, that explains it. Yeah, I agree. But in the Sunset Expanded 0079 <laughs> series, two seasons, 50 episodes each season, we'll expand on it. In the 100 episode version of Mobile Suit Gun. <laughs> <laughs> 200 episodes, 100 each season. <laughs> 18 will be devoted to Mirai's father. <laughs> 15 episodes on the hidden romance between Makuve and Cassilia. <laughs> <laughs> I just have to say that um, I'm glad I was spared from seeing Dagwin actually die. <laughs> <laughs> I see him get hit with the light. <laughs> I think I see more of Rebel getting killed. But yeah, I'm glad I was spared seeing him get like, you know, flung across the bridge incinerated. <laughs> well, what did you think about the solar ray system in general? I mean, because we had the solar flare system and the solar ray system. Those were our two super weapons for the series. Later series maybe have more super weapons, but they're all fueled by these ones. So I didn't remember that the solar ray fired kind of like in the beginning of an episode, like it was no big deal. It almost seems like they it was such a good secret. They really didn't <laughs> tell anybody else in the Federation fleet, right? They had like a vague idea there was a weapon, but... Then it got fired. They're like, oh, I guess they're firing a weapon. Yeah, and then they all <laughs> died. <laughs> Man, it was, it was such a good blow to Xeon. It was so epic to see. But the solar ray, this time around, I don't remember them mentioning that it had burned out or that they fired it too early. They did not. They did not. Yeah, I, I, I was listening yeah. to that and I was like, oh, I thought we talked about that. But yeah, they didn't do that. But they made a big point that it could only be fired once. Maybe that's what you were remembering uh, before. Uh. Okay. It was not built to be fired yeah. multiple times. But I, I in that same conversation, though, they did say they implied that there would be an arc, which meant that they would sort of sweep it a little bit. I see. So this is a case of Revel split the fleet, maybe, to meet with Dagwin. Mm-hmm. And by doing that, the solar ray was less effective because it couldn't hit the whole combined Federation fleet, you think? Well, it could be because there was that other mention. Garen says something after... But, but I think it was before Kaisili gets there, but after he had fired it, he says the number of ships, uh, and he's referring to the number of ships left or the number of ships still at Abawaku that are coming in from the Federation. And he says the number of ships doesn't make sense based on what Kaisilia had told us. Yeah. I, was I to interpret that Kaisilia gave him bad info on purpose or is it because of the fleet splitting thing that you're talking about? No, I, I assumed at that point Castile already knew based on what she was talking about with her, the officers on her bridge. So I think she gave him a bad count. On purpose? What was the goal of doing it on purpose, though, at that point? Yeah, that's a good point. Like, because if she gets back, then... She she wouldn't have known that he had killed Dagwin at that point. She strongly suspects. <laughs> well, yeah, it, yeah. Yeah, but not before giving him the count, I think. I don't know. Yeah. I'm not sure either. Well, listeners, if you know what we're talking about, please explain it. <laughs> yeah. Because, <laughs> I mean, if she gave him a bad count and she's going back to about coup, she's going to be facing the results of that bad count. Hey, exactly. That's my <laughs> point. Like, they're still somewhat on the same side, you know, for, yeah. for better or worse at the time being. You know what? Maybe she's just being petty. She's like, you know what? You think you killed half the fleet? <laughs> nah. I'll tell you you killed half the fleet, even though technically you only killed like 25%. <laughs> yeah, because like he goes, he goes, we have reduced their forces by 50%. But then when she sees that he had fired it, she goes, check how many are left. They couldn't have even got uh, 40% or something like that. So she, yeah. she obviously had a different assessment. And then when she's sitting in the chair later, she like, I don't know where says, are you sure? And then like the officers in her little corner, are like, yeah, we're positive. <laughs> and they're like, oh no, a new Federation fleet's coming. Yes. Does that mean, I guess, whoever took over after Revel or, or Gop or whatever scrambled a new fleet after hearing the Sol Ray fire? Either that or they, they just had more than Zeon thought they did. Okay. Boy, everyone's counting bad. <laughs> That's those, those Minofsky particles, man, you know, you... It's hard to count when you got those things flying around. Oh, did you catch Garen saying Stardust this time? I did. I did. I had my ears yeah. out for that one. Yep. So they turned my turned our enemies into Stardust, and I was like, there it is. There you go, <laughs> right before the last Hail Zeon. So Isaac, we also saw the emergence of new types in this back half. They had been hinted at a little bit in the first half, but we really went full on in it in the second half here. 
there were some hints right building up the hints were pretty good again continuing with the, with the show's theme of showing not telling some hints that we got were when matilda came on board mirai became very afraid after staring at matilda for a second did she feel matilda's impending death because that's that's how i took that i would assume so but at the same time, we didn't see a lot of new type premonitions by that point. So it's almost something that rewards you if you watch it later. <laughs> That's fair. Very sad, though. Yeah, poor Lieutenant Matilda. Her hair was strikingly red, by the way. It was like overly red. Did you notice that? Not as red as that cockpit after she oh. got smashed into a pulp. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. Hail <Hells> Zion. <laughs> oh, man. So when the crew, when the white base crew was at Jaburo, our heroes take turns explaining how their physicals went. And Amuro's like, oh yeah, they, I was in there a lot longer. They were doing the, the brain scans on me and everyone was like, oh, okay. Like with the tone of like, well, that's weird. Like I didn't get brain scans. They told me I'm like, I'm just fine. Your, <laughs> your brain's no good. <laughs> <laughs> we only want the, the guys with the big brains. <laughs> well, speaking of big brains, did you notice that Shalia Bull and Lala have huge helmets, I guess, for their huge new type brains. <laughs> well, she needs it for her hair. Uh, <laughs> what about Shalia? He has normal hair. He's kind of got a lot of hair, too, if you think about it. <laughs> He's really skirting those regulations. The Saikamus or whatever. Maybe they you require bigger helmets for those. But they, they were just these giant space helmets they had on. Big mega mine helmet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They look like an amphibious he- mobile suit wearing that thing. To, to what you said about him earlier, I kind of want to learn more about him, right? And his story, it seemed like there was a lot of potential with him and he came from Jupiter and he just came back. He's clearly good enough that they want to put him in this prototype mobile armor that's virtually untested and and it did really well, at least for a while before being destroyed. Man, what what's his side story manga series like? Yeah, you get like sort of his whole plot in like one or two episodes and I agree, he's really intriguing. I wish we got more. I wish he didn't die so soon. His death was pretty anticlimactic. I mean, Amro just kind of was like, ah, I'm done with this battle, and he just kind of stabbed him. But there was a lot of showing and not telling happening here, and it was really fast, even for the standards of, of this show and this type of writing. He walks in, they say, oh, he's back from Jupiter. He's like the head of the Helium-3 fleet. And Garen's like, you know, you're a new type. I need you to do this thing. And he already senses that he will serve under Kaecilia. But then Garen asks him to think deeper about why he's sending him there to Kaecilia. Does that imply that he wants Shalia to kill her or keep an eye on her? Do you remember that part? Uh, Vaguely. I mean, I don't think he would kill her. He doesn't seem the type that would kill her, right? No, no, no. He seemed very professional officer. Absolutely. Literally, the only reason they put a man of that age into the cockpit, I assume, was because... As far as they were concerned, he was one of the few confirmed new types. Yeah. What I also thought was interesting about him is this is a guy that was sent specifically by Garen, who Char clearly hates. Not that he doesn't hate Kaecilia, but he obviously also hates Garen. Char did not really hate Shalia Bull. He says of him after he died that he was a man caught between Kaecilia and Garen who couldn't put on an act. That's like a very specific description and he also says that we should let him rest in peace. So Shard didn't mind this guy, which is very rare. I, I, you know, Shard doesn't particularly like many people in this show outside of Lala. Yeah, that's an interesting way of putting it. He was very much almost too professional. He wasn't really going to play the political game that everybody else seemed to be playing. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, would, I agree with you. I, I would have liked more Shalia Bull. He was pretty interesting. He seemed like an okay guy, too. Yeah, he was more, he was like Space Robber Rall. Yeah, you're you're not going to get atrocities with uh, Shalia Bull. Isaac, let's talk about Kaecilia. So one thing I liked about Kaecilia in the back half was she was the only one smart enough to look into Char's background and, and ruin his little charade. Yeah, but man, did she miscalculate in terms of, <laughs> oh, yeah, y- you caught me, but you know what? <sighs> I really can't stand this federation. We'll, we'll deal with our issues after they're gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oops. Sure thing, son of the man my family plotted to kill. <laughs> I gotta say, so listeners, if you've if you've never watched this show, you should at least go watch this part where Char shoots Cecilia <laughs> in the head. It's the headshot of all headshots, right, Isaac? I mean, it's perfect. Yeah, it's it's pretty brutal. It like goes through her neck and the chair, kind of catapults <laughs> her backwards, and then of course the rocket detonates inside the bridge and kills everybody in the bridge. 
And his, his line is great, too. He says, Garma, I'm sending your sister to join you. Consider this my farewell present. And then he fires. Ironically, it was somewhat unnecessary because if you remember, the minute, <laughs> the second that Zanzibar was out of the, the docking bay, like there's like two Salamuses kind of waiting and they like blow it away. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask you about that. So, right, she would have just died anyway. Yeah, I, I mean, unless the plan was... I'm in the Zanzibar, broadcast an immediate ceasefire so that my ship can meet with whoever's in command and we'll negotiate. Mm. Or I, don't, I have no idea what would have gone differently if the bridge was still intact. Maybe they would have been able to put up a better defense or put up some uh, some anti-beam uh, mist and gas. Yeah, and they would have booked it out of there. Who knows? But as, from what I can see, they were they were toast before the the ship left the docking bay. I agree. Oh, I think that's why one of the officers was kind of really complaining. Like, you know, I don't care if there's Akus. Send something out to escort us. Yeah, I do remember that line. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that could be why. Yeah. Maybe they would have bought them time or at least sending Zakus out there would have at least occupied the Solomuses while they get away. Yeah, drawn the fire, perhaps. Also on this rewatch, I noticed, is this why you love Cassilia so much? Because there's that scene where she's really bothered by Lala's flowing clothes and insists that she put on EZ on uniform and she even, like... <laughs> <laughs> demands that regardless of the shortage like someone needs to get this chick a uniform like she shares your affinity for uniforms and like uniform you know conformity <laughs> i mean it's partly yeah that's <laughs> that's partly true why i like her i also like how she goes into serious mode where she like covers her face with her mask yes. so you can't tell what she's like thinking she's like uh oh I, I better put my mask on <laughs> time to think <laughs> Is that the official reason for the mask, or is that your headcanon? Because that actually kind of makes sense. She's, it's like it's like her poker face, right? Yeah, I mean, she's always been so sneaky and backhanded compared to like Girin and Dozel, especially and even Garma. So I think she's very much okay. You need to be mysterious. Put on something that covers your face. Nobody really knows what you're thinking. Everybody will keep thinking that you're a very mysterious person. So just do it. It gives you an edge. There was two other things about Casilla. One, there was that moment when you knew that she knew that Zeon had lost. And that was when she's on her bridge and she's asking why the Doms and the Gelgoogs are faring so terribly. Yeah. Her officer guy, Twanig, I think was his name. Twony or something like that, yeah. Informs her that students are controlling these and although they're fully trained, they're young, they're not doing well. (laughs) And like, at that moment, you have to know you lost, right? Yeah, pretty much, but... (laughs) What did he say? You won't find more patriotic pilots. He did. That was his exact line, yes. <laughs> but we only see one of those pilots once, and very tellingly, he calls out to his mother before he dies. I think he gets shot by the Gundam or something else. Mm. You know, his his cockpit's kind of heating up, and then he goes, Mommy, and then the, the Gundam blows, or his mobile suit blows up. Yeah. So, yeah, these are very young men, unfortunately, um, pressed into service. Depending on what sources you read, according to this, they were volunteered. But then again, that was her officer telling Kaecilia. Um, yeah. And according to um, MS Igloo, it seemed like maybe they were half pressed into service, half volunteered. Yeah, it, it seemed pretty mixed in Igloo, right? There was some patriotism there, yeah. but it also seemed like a lot of them were scared. Right. If you're in high school, you're now a pilot yeah. or something Good like luck. That. Here's a Gelgoog. Ooh, speaking of Gelgoog, Brian... Shar said something very interesting. When he was pulling up to Balaku and things were getting ready to battle, all the mobile suits were heading out, and he says, Wow, they sent out all the Gelgoogs. It's two better than one for me. And then Kaisila kind of pitches into Zeong. Mm-hmm. Do you think if Shar had a Gelgoog, he would have done better? No. Because he's more familiar with it? No. 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 <laughs> Amaro had already beat him in the Gelgoog. He, he couldn't use his Gelgoog because it was damaged from the last battle. Yeah. So. If anything, Amaro's getting better, not worse. So I, I, he, he would have beat him anyway. Shar did all right in the Gelgoog. I do think he probably underperformed in the Zeong, uh, or the Jiong, I guess, as the show said. Yeah. But I, I think he probably should have done a little better in that. Do you think that the Zeong or the Jiong, do you think it should have been red? Was it weird that it wasn't red? It wasn't weird because it sounded like they were assembling it to give to who knows who. I mean, was it Shalia originally supposed to get it? That's interesting. Did they have some other new type pilot who died before or couldn't get there mm-hmm. in time? I don't know. But um, for that reason, since it wasn't specifically for Shar, I think that's why it wasn't red. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely get that. I just mean it was weird that he had red stuff the whole show and the one he goes out on isn't red. Yeah, but for all we know, the artist did a mock-up of it red and... Maybe it was too demonic since it's got those antlers. Mm. 
So they were like, ah, eh, this, this doesn't work for us. Let's, let, what, what else can we do? Well, we can slap on some, the, the usual Xeon Dom colors. Okay, we'll, we'll mostly go with that. Yeah, okay, that's fair. One last thing about Caecilia. When things are looking bad, right, she tells Twanig to surrender a Balaku 15 minutes after she leaves. And then he's like, okay, what about me? And she's like, well, I promised to get you first in the prisoner exchange. But, like, this dude just saw her shoot Gearn in the back of the head. Should he really believe her that she's going to get him out of the prisoner exchange first? I mean... Because I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I think he should. I think Kaecilia is there for her team. Okay. Um, she's not there for her brother after he murdered her father, <laughs> but I think I think she would have gone through with that. Okay. All right. You would say that, you uh, zombie loyalist. <laughs> <laughs> I can see her doing that for, like, Makuve, definitely, right? Can't you? Uh, Yeah, I could see it for Makuve, for sure, yeah. I would see the same for Twani, just because he's Space Makuve. <laughs> space Makuve. <laughs> we had Space Rambo Rao and Shalia Bull, <laughs> and we have Space Makuve and Twani. <laughs> okay, let's talk about Amuro's dad and how much of a jerk he is. <laughs> oh my god, what happened after he went to space? I don't know. So Amro continues to prove Isaac that he's such a good guy, right? Kai tries to leave, and Amro's like, oh, Kai, if you leave, you're going to need some money, so here's my toolbox. You could sell it. Amro's just like a shirt-off-his-back kind of guy. He meets his dad yeah. again in Side 6, and his first words are, oh, hi, Amro, how's the Gundam doing? Isaac... This just isn't the worst dad. <sighs> Come on. I feel <laughs> I feel like Omar was very justified in thinking that he had brain damage <laughs> after after everything they've been through and something had happened to him because he was acting so weird, right? right? Like so abrasive and then just the technology obsessed. He was a man who kind of lost everything, had to kind of put together his life there. And for whatever reason, the work just took over more of his life than, you know, his family. So Tem Ray is not anybody's fan favorite. <laughs> <laughs> so do you buy the brain damage idea or what do you think? No, I th- I think it's, well, damage more in the sense of like psychological because everything he went through, he, this thing he worked on got t- kind of taken away from him and hijacked and got, didn't get to see Amaro. Not that he really cared about Amaro even before this. So yeah, this is a case of s- someone being unfit to be a parent at the same time losing the one thing they did care about and this is the result (laughs) yeah i wasn't really clear if if the brain damage thing was real just by watching the tv series apparently in the third compilation film spoilers i guess he he falls down his stairwell (laughs) i'm real pushing yeah well maybe (laughs) uh but i guess that kind of implies that maybe he's not doing well so maybe he really does have brain damage but yeah i couldn't tell on the first watch if it was just Amro making an excuse like, you know, that's why my dad doesn't like me, blah, 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 that kind of thing. But yeah, probably certainly doesn't help Tem Ray's image. Tem Ray's just a mess. He was a mess before this in terms of not being there for Almero and being so obsessed with the Gundam. And then when the war actually started, or at least came to their side, it became a case of him just not having to his life's work available to work on. And who knows what he knows about the white base. It almost seems like he forgot about it, right? Yeah. And, he made no effort to look for Amaro, apparently. It's just the worst welcoming for Amaro. <laughs> My heart goes out to Amaro. That was so terrible. Yeah, it was rough to watch. Poor guy. Because he's not really getting a lot mm. of support, right? I mean, I guess besides, like, the white base is basically his family now, so. Yeah, and, I mean, they all support each other, but to an extent, they're all kind of four siblings, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. in a way. I mean, Bright, at this point, is not really Amaro's father figure. He's just... No, he's not old enough. Yeah, he's the ship older brother. Yeah. You know, that's about it. You know, Mirai's just maybe Amaro's surrogate big sister. Yeah. So they all support each other and all that, but they're closer to equals than the more hierarchical structure you'd get with, like, Tamray being actually his his dad. Yeah. So uh, Tamray, not a fan. Don't like you. <laughs> Hope one day my, my dom encounters you in whatever civilian city or location you're at. <laughs> It will not go well. The heat rod will go through him <laughs> like a hot knife through butter. Yeah, pretty much. I'll, I'll say, all right, village, everybody's okay. <laughs> Just send out Tim Ray. <laughs> it's like, who are you? I'm Admiral Isaac. You don't know me. <laughs> <laughs> but I know Amaro. <laughs> so, Isaac, I think the two biggest parts of the back half of this show, I thought, were the developments between Shar and Sela, and then separately, 
Amro, Shar, and Lala. So which one would you like to discuss first? Hmm. Lala. Lala, okay. <laughs> Let's get the worst out of the way. <laughs> so I actually liked Lala more on, on this pass. I'll agree with you half of the way. I'll, I'll say that I kind of matured in my response, and she was less annoying <laughs> than I originally remember the first time I watched it. She came off as much more level-headed. Yeah. Not too confident at first, but she kind of got over that. But she was a much more reasonable character, and I wasn't really annoyed by her at all. It was just kind of more like, oh, I remember you. I, I used to be annoyed by you. <laughs> <laughs> I see you're still in a moo-moo. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Is it, it's mostly the moo-moo that gets you, I, I feel like. part. Of, yeah, me and Kaecilia, we have very, very strict approaches to how you need to dress for, for war and combat. <laughs> So I liked it the second time because I realized that there was a big sort of connection to Shar's counterattack here that I didn't remember since I hadn't watched the show in so long. But to sum it up, early in the 30s, the episode 30s, I think it's 33, Amaro sees a swan, he gets a new type flash, he meets Lala. They don't really know who each other are, but they they watch the swan die uh, over this lake. Hmm. And then it stops raining and, and Lala runs off. Later on in that same episode... Amuro gets his car stuck, and Shar and Lala pick him up. This is probably one of the better scenes in the show. Amuro tells Shar his name. Shar feels like he knows Amuro from somewhere, but he doesn't know who Amuro is. Amuro, though, knows it's Shar. He senses that it's Shar, which follows with the idea that Amuro is further along as a new type than Shar is, because right all the way up until the end, Shar doesn't even know if he's a new type, <laughs> but Amuro is like uh, full on in it. And Shar will never catch up. Yeah, yeah pretty much. <laughs> because Amro is the superior pilot. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Then a little bit later, Lala is finally the one to get Shar to put on a normal suit, Isaac. If you remember, Shar was like, I never wear a normal suit because I always intend on coming back. And if I don't come back, then it's yeah. not going to matter. But in that same episode, Amro finds Lala. And this is one of the battles in the Elmuth. He destroys her bits. He starts conversing with her mentally. And Lala is starting to become a bit broken up because she reveals that she's fighting for Shar because he saved her life, which we saw in the origin. Mm -hmm. But now she's concerned, and I think she's realizing very quickly that she is sort of following the wrong person or she's regretting why she met Amuro now and not earlier. Because, right, she she can't have this same mental conversation with Shar, right? Because Shar... Yeah. I mean, they don't show it, but it implies that he he doesn't know the extent of Lala's powers, you know. Otherwise, he wouldn't have to ask her all the time, are you feeling okay? Is is your head hurt? Blah, blah, blah. He would just know, because Amuro Amuro would just know. And I kind of bought this, Isaac. She's basically upset that she met the guy that she thinks she has a better connection with too late. And I think that's understandable. We've seen it happen before in fiction or in real life. Yeah. And, you know, they have a connection that just she and Shar don't have. And then at least met not yet on the Shar's part. Maybe Shar has it after Lala's death. I'm not sure. Maybe that's debatable. I'd probably have to go watch some more stuff to catch up on that. But And then <laughs> I thought the Elmeth destruction was done well. I bought it that he accidentally stabbed her, you know, with all that was going on. Sayla was there. Shar was there. Lala, Amaro. They kept second guessing. And then she got in the way and boom, ate the saber to the face. She's in the Moo Moo Isaac because it, it looks like a swan. She has the same swan like quality. So the swan dies in the Elmith, just like the episode near the lake. It was it was foreshadowing. And then a very significant exchange. So Amaro's talking to the dying Lala or the dead Lala, I guess. You know, didn't take that long. You get a saber to the face, right? It's pretty instant. <laughs> If she was talking to the di- the dying Lala, it would have gone like, ah! yeah, the conversation's <laughs> over, and she's being cooked by that beam. <laughs> and she says, "People are becoming like us." And Amaro eventually says, "People will be able to control time once people understand each other." And she says, "She can see time itself, which is basically she's beyond the time, Isaac." And that's the main theme. That's the theme song of Shar's Counterattack. She now exists beyond the time. Right? Time is no longer limiting to her. She can talk to Amaro. Whenever she wants. Amaru even says that. He says, sorry, I didn't die in this battle at the very end, but I know that I can talk to Lala all the time, like anytime I need to. And that's a big thing for me because I think that's what Tamino meant by beyond the time. This idea that Amaru said they can control time. I don't think that means they can actually control time in the sense of like time travel, but it's just this ability to communicate at any time. Kind of like Force Ghosts in Star Wars, right? Absolutely. And I think this gets proven and brought up again recently in Hathaway's Flash, where Quest talks to Hathaway. 
Yes, that's that's a great point. And you know why? Yeah. It's because Tomino wrote that as well. But mm. some spoilers for Unicorn and Gundam Narrative. <laughs> this is where I think the, the new type stuff is perhaps being taken in a bit of a wrong direction. Because in Gundam Narrative, they I'm not going to go too much into it. We'll save that to another day. Uh-oh. They blatantly explain some things that new types have the ability to manipulate time. And I don't think that that's what the original intent was here. To me, beyond the time means that you just exist outside of time. Time is no longer relevant to you. To me, it doesn't mean that new types can control time and, and move it forward or move it backward. That wasn't what I took from this. So... That irks me a little bit, just because this is the, the climax of the show, and to me, this is the original intent. But I'd be really curious what some listeners think on that. Maybe I'm off base, and maybe I'm just being overly critical, but but we'll get into narrative another day. Right. I don't know. Is that too critical, Isaac? What do you, what do you think here? No, I, I can see the argument for time control, and let me explain. I don't mean, you know, a bunch of new types are, like, going through time. Right. <laughs> Although we did pitch Chrono Gun. Yeah, well, right. But we didn't pitch it with like new type power. We pitched it with a, yeah, a, an engine. They're forcing it with tech. <laughs> yeah. I think the only way it could work is people saying, oh, well, the reason, you know, new type pilots move so fast and have such quick reflexes or they're able to move their mobile armors or mobile suits so fast and shoot more, or maneuver faster, things like that is they're time traveling in the sense that they can move themselves faster through time. They're speeding up time Mm -hmm. just for themselves or they're seeing into the future just for themselves. But I think more to the point which you're meaning as far as Tomino, as a new type, your consciousness can exist without your body. So for that, you literally are, you know, beyond the reach of time. You will be in, in Quest in Hathaway's case, a part of their life, even if your body's not here. Correct. So I, I think that's very, very much what it means. Or, or Lala in terms of you know, and Shar's counterattack when the, the light appears around the Earth and all that. And oh, it's a mixture of Shar's light and Amuro's light and Lala's light. And okay, sure, you know, everybody got reunited. <laughs> <laughs> everybody lived time. happily ever after beyond the time. Yeah, yeah. If you're <laughs> if you're a new type, it's a pretty great deal because you'll live forever. That's true. You know? <laughs> There's, there's the Shalia Bull voice out there if you want to talk to him. Not a lot of people want to talk to him, but he's out there. <laughs> he's like, hey, guys, why does no one ever hit me up for advice? Yeah. Did I ever tell you kids about that time I went to Jupiter? <laughs> <laughs> I saw a space whale. <laughs> <laughs> Next time, Mr. Bull, I, I think that was Seed. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think he came back and he was like, hey, there's this dude out there. He just doesn't seem very nice. You guys might want to keep tabs on him. Yeah, oh, the, he's just screaming constantly. You guys have to watch out. He's he's a nut. It's Crux <laughs> He's coming. <laughs> <laughs> so after Lala dies, Isaac, Amro and Shar, you know, they argue a little bit more. Amro demands to know why Shar got Lala involved, you know, sh- saying she wasn't meant to be a war a warrior, which I think that's a fair comment. But then Shar is like, you know, you're misguided. He kind of takes credit, not really takes credit, but he's like, hey, without this war, she wouldn't have become a new type. She wouldn't have awakened anyway. And then it gets a little weird. You know, Amara Ashar is like, new types like you, Amara, are too dangerous. I'm going to have to get rid of you. We're going to get into Shar in a second here. But Shar kind of went from wanting to kill the zombies to then wanting to enter an age of new types. And he does a lot of decision making in the last like two episodes, Isaac, where he finally meets Amara and Sela inside of Baoku. You know, they, they have their little fencing duel he eventually just kind of leaves him alone and he's like hey you guys should fight with me for new types when zeon's gone lala would be proud and they get separated one of the most interesting parts i think is when Shar tells sailor that amuro is calling for you now i think this is a, a reference to how the novel was where amuro and sailor they were together right amuro dies in the novel but that's that's separate but that's terrible <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is different, right? It wasn't meant to go beyond the novel, I don't think. So it, it was kind of just over. Solar, solar ray kills everybody. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> but to me, that's that's setting up like a would-be romance in the future that didn't happen. I mean, obviously, Sela's voice actress, she wasn't available during Zeta Gundam, so they kind of had to write her out. To me, that line is setting up the future, and it never happened because of that. Like, I wonder how different Zeta Gundam would have been if Sela had played a, a different role. I feel like it would have been better, really, because it would have brought back almost a female lead. Who knows? 
But yeah. <laughs> more to the point, if Shar's back, it kind of raises the question of should Sayla also have very much a front and center role? It's ultimately, they decided no. Yeah. But um, it, it's a good what if, you know. They didn't show Shar dying, but and they put this line in, so they were at least somewhat thinking about the future of like, well, maybe it'll, maybe we can go on later on. It's, it's a weird line to kind of include. So anyway, I'm I'm a big like. Sayla fan in terms of like elevating her a little bit I feel like if that's what we're gonna see in the live action movie Isaac I feel like she's gonna play a bigger role um than she did in the in the show yeah I don't know if they're gonna make a new character if they're gonna keep her but I would be very surprised and to an extent disappointed if we didn't have stronger female representation than we did in the original series uh, well it was really strong already I'll say this active piloting I'll, right. I'll, I'll narrow it down We'll we'll both, I think, Brian, be a bit disappointed if we don't see active piloting. Yeah, I agree. Because, again, if you had just put Sayla in a mobile suit, that would have gone a long way. And then once you introduce this romance angle, it makes so much sense, Isaac, right? Yeah. Shar's sister falls in love with Amuro, his his arch nemesis. I mean, it writes itself. It's not like it's coming out of nowhere. Like, it was like that in the novel. They were hinting at it here. Shar was even telling her, like, Amuro is waiting for you. So, I don't know. I, I... to me, it makes sense. People may disagree, but that's my take. But It's funny because like, we just finished the series, but the movie's coming out, and I'm leaning towards them making it closer to the series, at least a fraction of it, and I'd really hope that they improve on it, you know? So it's going to be really interesting watching the movie when it comes out now that we just wrapped up the series. Yeah. I mean, you get a chance to kind of sharpen it, right? Yeah. Let's, we'll see how many backhands they keep and slap. <laughs> Somehow I think it's going to be zero. Well, actually, Sayla might be doing the backhanding. So I can, I can see a bright slap happening. Well, yeah, one bright slap, I agree. Yeah. Having Sayla slap people, though, that would be a good nod to the fandom. <laughs> Mirai slaps Slager, maybe. Or <laughs> Absolutely. Now, for Shar and Sayla, though, Isaac, let's try to chart Shar's evolution here. So he originally starts the show wanting to kill the zombies, right? Yeah. But then at some point around mid-series, he says he can't rest until the Gundam is taken down because Amuro has dented his pride. He asks Sayla to quit the Federation. But then Sayla is like, I'm not going to sit around and watch Shar waste his life taking revenge on the zombies. She sees his revenge goal on the zombies as like not worth it. And I'm not sure I agree with her there. If if the zombies did to my family what they did to Shar's, I think I would probably think more along the lines of Shar. What, what did you think about Sayla thinking what he was doing wasn't worth it? It's a very Sayla response because she's a more compassionate person. You have to remember when she went to Earth, she was a trained doctor, right, yeah. By um, in Spain. So she, she's younger than Char too, and to an extent, maybe a lot of the stuff that happened in Side Three kind of went over her head and might be more of a vague memory. That's true. She was younger. I can absolutely see Char, who was much more present in the moment when all that was happening, kind of give it a a, a focus for his revenge and and her being much more um dismissive. Well, that was in the past. Well, you know. Dad's ideas clearly have led to war, so I I really don't want to focus on avenging Dad. So yeah, I can see why she kind of put it in the rearview mirror and went all through life. What did you think about getting the story of Dagwin taking over Zeon kind of told to us? It's either Sayla telling Bright or Shar telling Sayla, where he says, you know, what Jim Baral told us when we were young was true. Zeon Zum Daikun wanted people to become new types, and Jimba felt Daikun pointed at Dagwin to say it was him who eliminated him. But then Degwin said it was him choosing him as as uh, his successor. That's pretty important. We got it in a small little nugget there. I think one of the things that had to have been condensed was more on this new type plot. I still liked it, but I felt like it needed a little bit more. And that was probably part of the casualty of the cancellation. Yeah, I can see that. And I feel like that is essentially something that maybe was better saved for Origin. Not that their plan was to do Origin. But the whole Xeon political setup, and there wasn't any time. So, yeah, it, it was definitely something that was cut for time. And I think they did it about as well as they could. You know, that might be the only time we see Xeon and then a young, thinner <laughs> Taeguin. <laughs> and the quick explanation about how he, you know, wiped out all their enemies and seized power and all that. It's about as well as we could have expected. I really don't think we should see it in the movie, though, because there's going to be no time. <laughs> yeah, there wasn't any real time in this series, I agree. It definitely w- it would yeah. also stop the momentum of the show to have, like, 
a few episodes of a flashback for a slow moving political situation. So I, I agree with you. You'd almost need like Char having a nightmare of like him seeing Dagwin like put something in an, a drink with Zeon and they're like toasting, you yeah. know, for liberation or something. And then, and then like, you know, he was a child, but then only later does he realize what it was. Yeah, that makes sense. He wakes up from the nightmare and in like a cold sweat <laughs> and he's like, you know, zombies, <laughs> zombies, <laughs> Dagwin. <laughs> That's about all I have on my list, Isaac, except the one thing I wanted to do. We pretty much hit on most of the mobile suits, but we didn't hit on the Gelgoog, but I think we both like the Gelgoog. So the Gelgoog's <laughs> just good, right? Yeah. You like the Dom more, I like the Gelgoog more, but they're both great additions to the, to the yeah. mobile suit pantheon here. I just wanted us to go through and rank the mobile armors that we saw, though. Wow. Because there were a lot of them. By my count, in the back half, let's ignore the Adzom. But there's the Grabro, which was the one underwater. There was the Ziong or the Jiong. There was the Zaccarello, the Big Zom, the Big Bro, the Brow Bro, and the Elmith. <laughs> so I think we can agree that the Zaccarello is the worst. Really? The one with the, I mean, the like corny face with the big scythe arms? Come on. Yeah, it was pretty bad. I'd even say the, the aquatic one. That one was... It didn't fare any any better, I felt, especially after they made a big hype. It was, I think that was the first mobile armor, and it did terrible. <laughs> yeah, I think that might have been the first one after the ad zone. Okay, I, I'd say those two are neck and neck. I don't, yeah, I don't count the ad zone because it was, it was almost like a walking base. <laughs> yeah, it was very slow moving, right? And these other ones are pretty fast. Yeah. I thought the grab row at least looked cool. Sort of. It, it, I feel like, I don't know, do, I, do you like it more with its arms deployed or kind of swung back and like mobility? Uh, swung back, I think. It looks, looks yeah. pretty neat. It, look, it looks like an F-Zero car. Oh, that's a great, <laughs> that's a great point. Ooh, we just, we just aged ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> when was the last time they released an F-Zero game? It's a good, good game. You have to like, oh, isn't Captain Falcon from <laughs> F-Zero? And then like, everyone's like, yeah, but none of our listeners have played F-Zero. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, after that... Oh, let's be honest. Everyone's fighting for second place, right? That's true. Because <laughs> we know the big, big Zom's, Zom's number up one. there, number one. Yeah. Okay. So what's next? What's number three? I don't like how the brow bro looks. Yeah, it, it always looked fragile, didn't it? Yeah, fragile or, or uh, I don't know, it, awkward. Yeah, although it's, it was the only one that really gave the Gundam a run for its money. Yeah, Elmeth did okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's true, but I don't like the Elmus look. It's ugly. It looks like, I don't know, a nipped rosebud that's green or something like that. I've always thought it was bizarre. I don't like the two weapons it has on it. Mm. Apparently, Lala doesn't either because she almost never <laughs> uses them. The one time she uses them, it doesn't work. You know, that she like misses. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> the bits were cool, though. Uh, I, I never liked how they looked. I think the Big Row looks okay. The Big Row is kind of like the Grab Row, very Valvaro-esque, just not as cool. Yeah, I I guess so. It's much more the same shape, right? It yeah. It actually, now that I think about it, it shows up in igloo, right? It does yeah. It does. Yeah, they had a second one. Yeah. <laughs> and completely didn't use it for high speed attacks. No, well, it, yeah, it was a slightly modified whatever. It, it had a slightly different name, but mass carrier repair and rearming one. Huge butt one. I called it the Nicki Minaj model. <laughs> it's got like a wedding dress train <laughs> thing on it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so big number one is Big Zom. Who's your number two then? Ooh, yeah, I'll go, I'll go with the aquatic one. I think I could agree with that. And then, but where are like the big hitters though? Where's the Zeong or the Jiang and the Elmith? That's not a mobile armor. You you consider it a mobile armor? Wow. Uh, yeah, I think the, the Zeong is considered a mobile armor. I consider it a mobile suit just because it's humanoid in shape, even though it's larger. What about the Psycho Gundam though? That's a mobile armor, right? So that has mobile armor mode. Oh. But it also has mobile suit mode. <laughs> Hence why it's it. Actually, almost all transforming mobile suits do that. They go into like their little mobile armor mode mm. and then their, their regular mode. All right, listeners, what do you consider the Zeong? <laughs> is it a mobile armor or a mobile suit? Maybe you're right. Maybe it is a mobile suit. And is it a Zeong or, or is, is it a Yeah, Jiong? do you say Jiong anymore? I know people used to do that. I know the dub said it that way. For some reason, I felt like that fell out of favor, but I guess I don't go around in daily life saying Zeong out loud. I have no one to really I usually just read it. Okay, so you're probably right. So the Jiong, we'll, we'll call that a mobile suit. Uh, so that makes this pretty easy then. It's Big Zom and then basically every, everyone else. Yeah, pretty much. And I put Elmuth near the bottom because I don't like the design. I don't like the colors. I feel like the guns are positioned kind of weird on it. It's essentially a bit carrier. 
That's it. Yeah, that's right. Nothing too wrong with that, but I like my mobile armors to always feature, you know, their own weapons, really. that That's really what sets them apart. They always have built-in weapons, unlike most mobile suits. Yeah. And they're just large and fast. Large and in charge. Not like the GOG. The GOG is thick in all the wrong places. <laughs> the GOG is terrible. <laughs> And they have a habit of being like shot through the head and then out like between their legs. Have you noticed that? No. I mean, they all just kind of die. After a while, I was like, well, they got shot too. So They're very good at taking beams to the head. Okay. So my, my list would be Big Zom, number one. The Grab Row is number two. Big Row, three. Elmuth, four. Brow Bro, five. Zoccarello, six. And I think I'd put the Ad Zom... Even with the Zoccarello, I couldn't decide. Probably above the Zoccarello. The Zoccarello is terrible. I can't believe you like the Zoccarello. It's got some interesting shapes to it. I feel the same about the Zoccarello as I do that one extended mobile suit with the big face that transformed. <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that one is pretty bad with the, the chest on the face, right? I <laughs> <Yes>. think. <laughs> All right, Isaac, that's, that's it for my list. Anything else you'd like to uh, bring up? <sighs> we covered everything, but talking about how we feel about this series i feel at the same time i noticed it's aging Mm -hmm. i enjoyed watching it again felt like visiting an old friend or something like that but it really needs to be redone it needs to be modernized lengthened and just represented just like they're doing with legend of the galactic heroes just just give it the gundam treatment I, i think i agree with you i did notice that in the last 10 episodes the art got a lot grittier but then I couldn't decide if that was because the animators were just under more pressure or because that was an actual stylistic change they were trying to go for. Like, there was a lot more shading. So I, I agree with you. I definitely noticed its age more, like you said, this time. And it's weird because I remember when we first watched it, we thought, wow, this is, looks pretty old. It's like 20 years later. Now it looks really old. Yeah, not even just the animation, but some of the computer sound effects and stuff like that. It's from a long time ago. So a facelift and a redo would be incredible, I think, for the series, for the fans. And it can be done in the same way Origin was, where it's represented, but everything's the same, but everything's new. And I don't say that because I don't like the show. I say that as someone who loves the show, who wants more people to watch it who haven't watched it. (laughs) Because I don't think, if you're a 13-year-old anime fan right now, Isaac, I don't think this is on the top of your list to watch. That doesn't mean it shouldn't be. I'm just saying they have a million things to watch on Netflix and Crunchyroll and whatever else, and they all look prettier than this. At this point, this is for diehard fans. But I enjoyed it so much that I'd have to give it the max score still. I'd have to give it five out of five Haros because it was great. And I can see myself rewatching it. Not anytime soon, but definitely in the future. I agree. I'm going to give it a 10 out of 10 because it hit all the right notes for me. Loved all the characters. And it was just hard hitting, Isaac. People were dying. There was intrigue. There was betrayal. There was real resolution. I don't feel like it left too many things up in the air. It was fast paced. I don't know. It was classic. It created a lot of the tropes that we still see today. So everybody needs to watch it. Listeners, tell us below what you liked about it. What you'd like to see if they redid 0079. And just in general, things you remember about it. Maybe things you didn't like, things you thought they could have improved. This is a a long series. It's the original series, and a lot of stuff happened. But it's the OG series. So tell us what you think about it below. Brian, since the Federation won, why don't you take us out with the Federation poem of victory? (laughs) All right, everybody. Don't forget... Before you go to sleep tonight, stand next to your bed, salute that frame picture of Amaro Ray, the greatest of all time, and recite the Federation Pledge. Into the night, Captain Bright. Londo Bell, Zeon Fell. Liberty and justice, Amaro trust us. You've said your farewell, now we'll give them hell. Good night, everybody.